Today I'm gonna to share with you the way you can think through a complicated scene and turn it into something that is paintable. It's these concepts and ideas that allow me to take scenes like this with a lot of positive and negative shapes, a lot going on here, a pretty complicated scene, and turn it into something that is achievable, something that is doable. The first thing we want to think about is our drawing. Drawing is an important part of watercolor because this allows us to have a plan of attack when we are doing our painting. If you're here watching my channel, you're probably familiar with watercolor and the fact that it's not super easy to correct. In other mediums, you can paint over things, you can scrape things away. You have a lot more flexibility when it comes to painting. In watercolor, once we set down the major washes of our scene, there's not a way to go back and do it all over again. It's something that's amazing about the medium because it's so instantaneous and you can move really quickly within this medium. On the flip side of that coin, it's not very correctable. So having a plan before you jump in, which includes your drawing, is very important. So the first thing you want to do is take your time with your drawing. You want to ensure that you have every bit of your painting planned out before you move into the painting process. With a scene like this, you might think, well, that's super complicated. Look how many windows are on the building. Look at how much detail there is. Look at all the things throughout the scene. If I'm gonna draw this and render it out, it's gonna take me forever. But that's where this first tip comes into play. And that is when we wanna squint at the scene and really think about the shapes of the scene. We wanna minimize a lot of the detail and a lot of the texture. So right away when we are looking at a reference photo, we want to squint, we want to simplify, and we want to see all of these little shapes in more of a connected way. When we're looking at this scene and we're squinting, we're looking at the background, we can mass together a lot of these buildings. By no means are we rendering out this skyline exactly like it is. That would be a job for a different medium, a different painter, that's not what I enjoy about painting. So we want to mass shapes together and simplify. And that starts with how we do our drawing in the beginning. The second thing we want to do is think about the values. And if you're not familiar with values, it's how light or how dark something is. I like to divide it into three groups of values, lights, midtones, and darks. And when you're thinking this way in the beginning of the painting, you're already setting yourself up to know how to tackle something complicated in simple stages. So when we're thinking of values, we're thinking about the light values, the middle values, and the dark values. One way to do this is to turn your photo black and white. By taking away the color information, we can more clearly see where the lightest areas are and so on. Once we've set up our drawing, once we've identified the values, we wanna think through our plan. And this is very important, having a plan. So typically there are three phases to my painting. The first is a wet and a wet wash that establishes all the light values of the scene. Once your paper dries, we want to think about a large connected shape of middle values. So finding that middle value shape, painting this in a connected way as much as we possibly can. And then finally, we add in the darks and the details. And that is typically the parts of your painting where there are figures, where there are little bits that need to add definition and add texture and interest into different areas. And when we put the final touches on the painting, that's what we do in this third and final phase. Now that I've given you an overview, let me show you practically what this looks like as I take this scene on. As you can see, this reference is very complicated. This skyline, there's so many things going on. So what I really tried to do was simplify. A lot of this down here is gonna be one connected middle value shape with a few little darks to kind of break up that area and imply a lot of detail. That's the key here, we're implying a lot of detail. So you wanna know where the main focus of your painting is, the figure down here, and we're implying that skyline trying to not get too involved in all the detail. Another quick note about the drawing, I have a few figures here. One thing you wanna do is keep the figure's heads relatively on the same plane. So that is the eye line, the horizon line, all kind of along that same line. That's gonna ensure that these figures are in scale with each other and everything is right within your perspective of the scene. So that's my drawing here. And you're gonna see what I do here is I wet down the back of the paper and the front of the paper. And now I'm ready to paint that first wash. 
And like I mentioned before, I'm thinking about all the lightest values of the scene. So in this scene, that's going to be the sky, the light sides of the buildings. And one thing I wanted to show you here, I wanted to keep these buildings simple and I wanted to imply the light side of those buildings that are way back in the distance. And so I lifted off, working wet into wet here, taking my time and lifting off a few little bits of highlight. So once I've dropped in the blue for the sky, now I'm going back in and I'm dropping in the light side of the buildings. So these are the parts of the buildings that aren't in shadow. I'm going to paint around these areas in the next phase of my painting, but I want to drop that light in now in the first wash. I'll skim through here. And so the, the paper up here is still damp. What I wanted to do was drop in this building while the paper is damp and just give it a little bit softer of an edge than some of the other buildings that are closer up. It's always fun to play with things when the paper is wet and seeing what kind of reaction you can get on the paper. You only have one time in the painting process where everything is so wet on your painting. And so I like to think, what can I accomplish during this phase? And because I've wet down both sides of my paper, things aren't drying terribly fast. I have time to work back into this wet area before the paper starts to dry. And you'll see down here, this edge is still damp. And it's right there waiting for me um, when I get down to that part. So I dropped in this building as well. And now I'm just filling in that area. A good way to think of this is a lot of this will be covered up. But if I leave little gaps in my next wash, what color do I want to be left behind? And that is the color you want to paint in this first wet and wet wash. Now another thing I'm doing is I have this little, I forget what you call this thing, a wind sock. It shows you which direction the wind is blowing and how hard the wind is blowing. It's this great orange color. And I wanted to include that in the scene because so much of the painting is cool. The background is cool. The buildings are, uh, are cool. A lot of the shadows are gonna be cooler colors. And this little pop of orange, I thought would be a nice touch. So I'm dropping that in now while my paper is wet. And here I'm doing the same thing, lifting off, of, off a few highlights, always setting up for the next wash. Okay, now I get down to the water level, and you'll notice that the water is a bluish green color, but this is not the final value for the water. I'll have to go over the water one more time in the next phase of the painting to outline the warm color of the dock. The dock is a lighter value, the water is a stronger value, so I'm setting that up for the next wash as well. Dropping in some lighter colors for the railing there, and now I'm dropping in the light area of the dock. And you'll notice as I get to the bottom here, I'm darkening that up and cooling it down. A lot of that's going to be in shadow. Now I'm dropping the light color of green over here on the right of the painting, and I'm also dropping in some skin tone for the figures, and whatever the light color of their clothing is as well. And that is a look at the first phase of the painting. So I have all my light values in. Now that my paper is dried, I want to think about the middle values of the scene. I'm really squinting at that skyline. Remember, I want to combine as many of those shadow shapes as I can. Because this shape is so complicated, I can take my time and always work from a wet edge. And I'll talk about that more as we get into this. So I'm starting over here on the left side of the paper, and I'm really thinking about the shape of the shadow of these buildings. So you can see how that light I left in the first wash is very important. So right away I'm trying to paint all of this as one connected shape. And notice how the shadow of the building connects right into the shape of this pillar here. I'm always looking for connections as well. Working my way through. Really trying to see that shadow as one connected shape. Again, connecting these into the shadow in the background. All those shadows are connecting. While this is still wet, I move back down into the water because I want to get that final value in for the water. And you'll notice here I'm painting around the front side of this to show the light there. By painting down to where this railing is, 
you're starting to get a feeling of light in the lower part of this painting. So I'm working back over to here, still connecting that into the large shape of the shadows of the building, into any of these similar values in the lower portion of my painting. Back into the shadow shape. Okay, got the final value on that building. There's this overhang here that's gonna be a lot darker in value. So I'm gonna go ahead and paint that. After we're done with this middle value shape, now I can go back in with some darks and I can define the edge of the water there. And see that bit of definition, that little separation that's created there, goes a long ways in making this feel realistic. So now we're into phase three, which is the darks and the details. And this is what really puts the finishing touches on your painting. When you start to add more detail and richness in the middle ground of your painting, automatically that area starts to be pulled forward and your background will feel more like a background once you establish more of those values in the middle of your painting. Connecting my shadow right into those shapes. And now it's time to paint this main figure here. And as I get more value and strength there, this starts to feel a lot closer to us than the background. Some few more details on the figures. And what I love about this is, especially like this figure in the distance, I dropped in that light opera pink in the first wash. Then I'm going back with a stronger version of opera pink to do the shadow side. So it's helpful to really tackle things and think of light side, shadow side. That's been a common theme throughout this painting. Light side of the buildings, shadow side of the buildings. Light side of the figure, shadow side of the figure. And when you can think that way, it not only helps you simplify, but it helps create a believable feeling of light and shadow. Okay, a few finishing touches, a few marks here to suggest some of the detail in the railing. All right, now I'm going back it to some of those buildings, adding a few little dashes to suggest some of the visual interest back there, some of the windows, things like that. Again, I'm trying to do this cautiously and not overwork the background of the painting. I am to the point where I wanna paint this foreground shadow. The shadow seems believable. Here's the thing that's casting the shadow. And once we get that bit of shadow in, we're really starting to see the light in the scene, which is absolutely crucial. Okay, we are near the end of the painting. I have some gouache that I'm using, some white gouache. And what I'm doing is getting a few little highlights. Are there any bits of light that I wasn't able to paint around and preserve. I'm putting a white hat on this figure here. It helps that figure stand out from the background a little bit more. Some light on the shoulder of our main figure here and putting a little bit of light at the tops of these to separate them a little bit more from the background. When you can take the time to build up your painting from your lightest values through to your strongest values, you are left with a great feeling of light. Here is a look at the finished painting. I hope that you're beginning to see and understand how we can group shapes together. We can think through everything by light side, shadow side, and we can methodically build up the value in your painting to take on a scene that seems very complicated and to make it into something that is paintable. Have you ever been really excited about a painting and you get all set up, you find that right reference that you're excited about, and then it's time to go and you feel lost? You ever had that experience? You just are having a hard time finding consistency. Some of your paintings turn out, some of your paintings don't turn out, and you're not really sure why. Well, I have a free resource that I wanna to give to you today that can help with these problems. My five steps to plan a successful watercolor painting. I walk you through the crucial planning phase of your painting that will help you understand what you're going to paint first, second, and third. The planning is really so important, especially in watercolor. This medium is harder to correct. It's so immediate. So having that plan is very important. I send you a PDF that you can download. And the great thing about this is you can have it on your phone, you could print it out, and you can take a look at these crucial planning steps before you start each painting to ensure that you're thinking through these important things as you get started. You can download this right now before you start your next painting. All you have to do is follow this link here and download my five-step guide to planning a successful watercolor painting.